Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. My name is Jake Schlesinger, president of the United States Japan Foundation. Thank you to everyone joining us here in Chicago on this beautiful spring day, <clears throat> and to everyone tuning in from around the world, where hopefully it's better weather, for our jointly hosted event, the 21st Century U.S.-Japan Relationship. Our conversation comes less than a week ahead of Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's visit to the U.S., which will include a summit, a state dinner with President Biden, an address to the joint session of Congress, a trilateral summit between the U.S., Japan, and the Philippines, all wrapped up with a visit to North Carolina to tout the $8 billion expansion of a Toyota battery factory there, adding 3,000 jobs. One overarching theme of the Kushida trip and our conversations today is to illustrate, illustrate and explain the new U.S.-Japan relationship, one that remains strong but looks quite different than it did even a decade ago. My organization, the United States Japan Foundation, is undergoing a similar transformation as we update our own focus and mission for meaningful impact during these changing times. We're here because we're holding our board meeting this week in Chicago, and many of our trustees are in the audience with us today. We're proud that this event features four of our grant recipients spread across both panels who reflect both the old and new aspects of the bilateral friendship and of our foundation's mission. We have Yuriko Romer's documentary exploration of trans-Pacific ties through baseball, Brian Christie's continuation of a traditional high school exchange program, but with a new twist, Emma Chandler Avery's work on preserving and adapting the trans-Pacific relationship at a time of rising isolationism in American politics, and of course, the survey work that informs how we think about all of this done by our host, the Council on Ch Council, Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Now, speaking of the council, I'm told that I need to remind you that they are a nonprofit, independent and nonpartisan platform. The views expressed by individuals on the council stage are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the council. And a couple more housekeeping matters. First, please silence your cell phones. Uh, and second, both panels will be followed by a Q&A session. For those of you in the room, there'll be a microphone in the center aisle. You can also submit questions online through a digital platform please enter ccga.live into your browser. That's ccga.live into your browser to add a question into the queue. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Council's Senior Fellow for Public Opinion and Foreign Policy, Dina Smeltz. Before joining the Council, Dina served for many years at the U.S. State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research. She now oversees the well-known annual survey of American attitudes toward foreign policy, the Chicago Council Survey, which for many years has been supported by USJF and this year celebrates its 50th anniversary. Please join me in welcoming Dina to the stage. Thank you for coming and thanks to those who are watching. Uh, it's set to be a, a great, interesting discussion today. Um, and thank you to the U.S. Japan Foundation for their continuing work to help support our um, signature product of the Chicago Council, the Chicago Council Survey. So we're going to start off the um, the evening, the afternoon, with um, just some background knowledge of what do Americans think about uh, global affairs, U.S. role in the world, and uh, specifically with an eye toward alliances in Asia. Um, we get generous support from the U.S. Japan Foundation for this study, especially the set of questions about Japan, but we also get funding from the Korea Foundation and um, most importantly from the Lester Crown um, Philanthropies, the Crown Family Philanthropies. <clears throat> so, um, I forgot. One second, I'm just going to switch to the slides. So the survey was conducted um, among 3,000 adults in the United States. The survey was conducted in English and Spanish. We conduct this survey every single year doing just kind of a comprehensive look at what Americans' important issues are on foreign policy and global affairs. And it was fielded September 7th through the 18th. And this was time just as 
there was continued, uh, there were debates about continued funding on Capitol Hill, and at that time the bill was stalled due to um, Republican resistance in the House, still being debated, of course. But these debates about Ukraine have also had an effect on American public opinion. Um, most directly, we saw over, and we're going to show you these numbers, but just kind of a quick highlight to walk you through the data. We saw a decline in the U.S. public commitment to funding Ukraine, especially among Republican Party supporters. Um, but more broadly, the survey also found drops in U.S. support for maintaining um, U.S. bases overseas and abroad, and also for defending allies. And just a note that this survey was fielded before the recent events, um, the October 7th Hamas attack in Israel and then the subsequent war in Gaza. Um, but we're going to show you a, a quick review of some of the findings from recent polls that also feed into this. So Americans are tuned into foreign policy, but some um, want to pull back a little bit, think we're overextending is basically what the overview of the survey showed. So the next slide is going to go quickly to support for Ukraine. I'm going to kind of just brush through these. We can ask questions about them later, but just to kind of set the stage for a discussion of where Americans stand on American commitments overseas. So you can see that um, at the start of the war, when we first started polling about this, there were high numbers of Republicans and Democrats supporting both economic aid and sending arms to Ukraine. But um, that has fallen pretty much across the board, but really, really, especially among Republicans, you see a big drop, both in economic support and in sending military and arms. Why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that uh, Republicans tend to think that the United States is focusing too much attention on Ukraine and not enough on China or immigration, which is one of their key topics. Um, another reason is the uh, fear of Russia or like the rise of Russian um, territorial aggression has receded also as other things have come to the fore. And then, so I, we didn't, we only shared one side, the support for uh, continued aid to Ukraine, but you'll see it's like a 60-40 split. There was some division within the Republican Party while Democrats are generally unified. It's the opposite kind of parallel um, for the Middle East conflict. And I'm just going to quickly run through this that uh, you see that Republican, first of all, it's very interesting that about a third or even more of Americans don't give their opinion on the U.S.-Israel conflict. That's pretty high for things that are in the news a lot. It might reflect that people, some people aren't following it closely enough to take a side. It might reflect the fact that our surveys also show majorities don't want to take either side. And it might also reflect the fact that it's a volatile and difficult issue to discuss these days. So that's one interesting thing. But among the bulk of those who do give an opinion, Republicans tend to think the United States should let Israel find its own way and use whatever policy it thinks is best um, without any pressure from the United States, while Democrats think we should use some sort of pressure, whether that's uh, reducing military aid to Israel until it ends its war with Hamas or to just exert diplomatic pressure but not um, reduce military aid. So that is in the case of Israel continuing its war. So just wanted to kind of show that they're, both parties are facing some challenges among their electorates on these really hot topics going on in the news. And then beyond just these two um, issues that are going on right now on a broader level, Americans are now less inclined to say the United States should take an active part in world affairs than they have in the past. This particular graph only shows Republicans, but overall, 57% of Americans say that the United States should take an active part in world affairs. That is higher among uh, Democrats at 70%, but that's also down from before. 57% overall is one of the lowest that we've seen in all 50 years of our polling. Um, but the most striking finding of any result in the whole survey was that now a majority of Republicans say that we should stay out of world affairs, 53%, compared to 47% who say we should take an active part. And when you look at this over time on a different figure we have, 
Republicans were always the highest on this number up until about 2015. And then the Democrats became the more internationalist um, Americans or internationalist minded Americans. So there's a lot of different reasons for this shift, but um, maybe that'll come up in the discussion as we continue on. Um, so the events going on in Ukraine also affected Republican party supporters' views of our alliance with Europe. You see that there's a little bit of a drop in those Republicans, the red line, that say that the alliance with Europe benefits both the United States and Europe or just benefits the United States. We combine those two numbers. Um, but on the other side, with Asia, Republicans, again, have shown on a number of measures that they've dropped in support for a lot of global initiatives, but on alliances in Asia, they have actually increased from 50% in 2020 to 59% now. Democrats are high and consistently high, but that's a big shift upward for Republicans and goes against the grain of some of these other indicators. And why is that? Well, that is because there's a growing sense of a threat from China. Um, overall, 58% of Americans say that the China's development as a world power is a critical threat to the United States. This is the highest point we've ever seen. That's the black line and the big bold font, 58. Um, but you see it's even higher among Republicans, 71%. It's been high for a while now, um, but it's also high among all the different groups. And um, this also helps to explain why Republicans and other Americans really want to reinforce our ties to Asia and our Asian allies. Um, and this just shows that, uh, again, there's some decrease in broader measures of support. Uh, there's, it's still pretty solid. Two-thirds still support bases in Japan and South Korea, but it's down a little bit from higher levels. And uh, same with Australia. And I'm um, not going to go into this in detail, but there's also some declines for support and bases in Europe. Again, still solid, but um, some declines. And where are most of those declines centered? It's, uh, well, it was mostly centered among the Republicans. There's been a big drop off from in the past year. Um, and then I'm going to skip this one because it's a little crowded. Hmm. Okay, so then I had talked earlier about um, drops and also support for defending allies. And this is something that our, uh, our researchers, our fellow researchers in Japan and Korea are really interested in too. Of course, everyone's worried about the credibility of the United States as an alliance partner. And um, we are seeing these new widening divisions between Republicans and Democrats on issues about defend our allies that weren't there before. So it's kind of an offshoot of domestic politics. Um, you see that 68% of Democrats say that we, the United States should use U.S. troops to defend our Baltic allies in NATO if Russia attacks them, but only 48% of Republicans agree. And then when we ask about uh, what if North Korea invaded South Korea, 57% of Democrats say we should use U.S. troops to defend South Korea, but only 46% of Republicans now agree. And then since we're talking about Japan, there's one that sort of defies the, the general trend of widening partisan division. We actually see Republicans and Democrats coming together um, very close. In fact, identical percentages, 45% would support using U.S. troops to help Japan if China initiates a military conflict with Japan over disputed islands. So um, taken together, uh, there's just some real indications that the America First approach to foreign policy is having a real effect on um, Republican Party supporters. And then also on the flip side, there's differences between the progressive and moderate Democrats on the Middle East war that's also creating similar challenges for Democrats as we go forward. Um, the 
kind of widening partisan divides is a bit concerning since um, we really want a bipartisan approach to what the top threats are facing our country and the world in general and how to deal with those threats. So um, we'll have to watch how things play out in the 2024 elections as each um, candidate speaks to its base and it'll be interesting to see the arguments they make for their point of view. So with that, I'm going to welcome the other panelists out and we're going to discuss these numbers, but also some broader issues. Thank you for your attention. Oh, Dina, thank you very much for that presentation. I always enjoy seeing our survey numbers uh, put into context like that. Let me also welcome to the stage Consul General of Japan in Chicago, Jun Yanagi, and Emma Chanlet Avery, Director for Political Security Affairs at the Asia Society Policy Institute. Emma, welcome back to okay. our stage, and Consul General, welcome to our stage for the first time. Great to have you here. As Dina mentioned, we're going to try to put some of these numbers into a broader context, and the initial context for that is, of course, Prime Minister Kishida's upcoming visit uh, to the United States. Council General, I'm wondering if you could set the stage a bit for us. So what should we expect to see uh, out of this summit visit, and what is Japan looking to get out of it? Mm. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, let me first put you in the perspective of Japan-U.S. relation uh, landscape. The, uh, let me say we are an I mean, international community, including Japan and the United States, uh, at the turning point of history when the uh, open and free international order has been challenged at an unprecedented level. And the, uh, like the uh, Ukraine uh, situation and Israel Gaza situation and heightened security situation in East Asia and climate change and AI and such, and such things. So against this background, the Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Chida will make an official visit to Washington on April 10th. On the, on the following day, he will uh, address the joint meeting of the U.S. Congress. Actually, this is the first time for the last uh, nine years since uh, 2015, when then former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe did the same. And the, this is a, a golden opportunity for the two countries to underscore the importance and the significance of U.S.-Japan alliance. And the, uh, Japan and United States have really become the global partners uh, for the peace and security and prosperity of the international community as a whole. So that's the one uh, important thing. The, also, the, the visit will demonstrate the uh, mutual trust and the friendship between the two peoples, including two leaders. And also, uh, as I said, the the, this visit will demonstrate to the world that the Japan and United States uh, stand united in upholding and uh, bolstering the free and open international order based on the rule of law. And the last three, uh, also Japan and the United States are now uh, indis indispensable partners, one another, in uh, maintaining uh, inclusive and sustainable e world uh, economic growth by uh, the, uh, maintaining the competitiveness of the, the advanced technologies and so forth. So these are what we expect to, to see at the end of the visit, yeah. Thank you, and Emma, from the US perspective, what is the US looking to get out of this? Uh, we've heard the sort of the Japanese perspective. What's the American side here? Um, well, first, thank you, Craig. Thanks for having me back. Um, I was here several years ago, and it was not nearly this fancy, I don't think. So <laughs> congratulations on your upgrade. Um, um, I agree um, uh, broadly with a lot of the things that Ambassador Yanagi said in terms of um, the state of the relationship now of the alliance. It's increasingly strategically aligned. Um, Japan has been more willing to be forward-leaning in terms of expressing their concern about stability in the Taiwan Straits. Um, obviously, um, very generous with aid to Ukraine. Um, so I do see the alliances in really good shape. 
um, the Biden administration um, has really elevated alliances. I mean, we have basically an alliance-centered foreign policy right now. Um, and Japan has been a really key, if not the key aspect of that. So Kishida coming for this official visit, um, it uh, continues that pattern of inviting allies um, to the White House. Um, it also it completes the Quad. Uh, Japan is the last country of the Quad, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue with uh, Australia and India to come for an official visit. So I think that has a nice, um, you know, concluding point to it. Um, the United States, I think, also wants to reward Japan. Um, for a lot of the um, progress that it's made in terms of committing more of its own resources to its own defense, um, to the foreign policy, global foreign policy initiatives that I mentioned before, um, for Japan's um, willingness to um, let some of the historical tension with South Korea um, um, go in favor of this trilateral um, um, commitment and initiative. So I think it's a, it's also a thank you to Japan for all it's done um, during the course of the Biden administration. And I think you can get a sense for just how appreciative some of the U.S. foreign policy establishment is for Japan. Uh, if you read uh, Ambassador Rahm Emanuel, our former mayor, Rahm Emanuel's uh, piece in the Wall Street Journal today, it's really just a laundry list of accomplishments uh, from the Kishida administration and fairly effusive in its praise. And if any of you have met Ron, before you know, he's not a man given to effusive praise. Mm. Uh, Dina, we've talked a little bit about sort of the, the governmental perspectives from the U.S. and Japan. How is, where's the public these days on the U.S.-Japan alliance? We've seen how the war in Ukraine and the war in Gaza have affected some attitudes toward alliances in Europe. Is it also affecting American views of Japan? Not really. Um, I think Japan is really kind of seen as a, well, first of all, Craig knows more than I do, so he's kind of feeding me these questions. Uh, Craig is actually usually the person who covers Japan in our shop. But um, uh, yeah, they're, they're really feeling very solid uh, about Japan these days. Uh, they have been for a long time. And it's almost amazing to think about the 80s and the turbulence of the 80s with uh, some of our economic conflicts that now how tightly Americans associate Japan and our U.S. ties to Japan with our own national security. Um, they see seven in 10 Americans think that U.S. ties to Japan strengthen U.S. national security, which is um, a real kind of compliment to Japan. Um, and they see, they have confidence in Japan to, to lead responsibly in the world. Um, and young Americans have as much confidence in Japan as they do in our own country, which is a, another interesting um, development. What they see, did I drop it off? You're good. Okay. What they see as sort of the top priorities for the um, security relationship is uh, number one, working to make sure that North Korea I just, that we limit, uh, we work with our Asian allies to limit North Korea's ability to expand its nuclear capability. Uh, and then of course, China is a big concern um, and to try to respond to China's um, influence in the world and in the region and then uh, spending more on their own defense, which as Ron points out in his article, and as Emma has just pointed out, um, Japanese seem to be paying heed to that, uh, that priority for American public as well. So of course, this isn't just a, gonna be a US-Japan meeting. Uh, there's also now going to be a uh, US-Japan-Philippines uh, leaders meeting as part of Kishida's visit. Emma, why the addition of this trilateral uh, onto the existing US-Japan bilateral meetings? Well, in the Biden Indo-Pacific policy, why not? Um, we have so <laughs> many trilaterals and quadrilaterals and bilaterals, um, but this is a new one, um, U.S., Japan, Philippines, and it's part of sort of showcasing um, how the United States is, is sort of, you know, creating a web um, of like-minded countries. Um, I think in the, in the case of the Philippines, um, the U.S. and the Philippines have had deepening um, defense ties anyway, but also sort of a a difficult history in that area. And I think there's some degree of um, trying to um, um, avoid um, dwelling on those historical differences by bringing Japan in. Um, it also allows Japan to showcase itself as being more involved um, in security affairs in the Indo-Pacific. 
Um, and it's interesting because I've done some work on um, Japan's approach to Southeast Asia um, compared to the United States. And the Philippines is one of these areas where when the U.S. and Philippines relationship has gone a little bit south, Japan has provided sort of this continuity in relations. Um, I think of when Duterte was president and got into, you know, a little spat with President Obama, like Abe was there and sort of secured that that linkage. So I think that um, has been to the benefit um, of the United States when Japan can provide that, that sense of continuity. Um, this also, though, I should say, this is very much like the trilateral with South Korea. This is a result of these three leaders being in place and seeing the world in the same way. And that world obviously has to do with a lot of Chinese maritime aggression and deciding it makes sense for them to sort of knit their interests together a bit more. But these are also all democracies. Um, so mm -hmm. the durability of these relationships can really depend on who comes into office at a time. So I think it is, um, it's elevating this idea of having like-minded countries bind together. Um, but I think there's a degree of fragility as well. And Consul General, from Japan's perspective, I mean, Emma's talked about Japan as a stabilizing factor in uh, Philippines' relationships with the United States. Uh, where is the Japan-Philippines relations going and where has it been coming from? Well, Japan and Philippine Asia has been very good. And uh, some years ago, I was in Vietnam and I noticed a lot of increasing uh, relation between Japan and Southeast Asian countries, especially uh, maritime cooperation and the South China Sea issues. And with regard to the upcoming trilateral leaders meeting, as you said, there are many trilateral meetings like Japan, ROK, US, and but uh, this is the first time ever. But as you said, the three countries share the, the same uh, basic values like democracy, but also Japan-US alliance and US-Philippine alliance, and ja both Japan and Philippines are the maritime countries. So it is a good opportunity for three countries to uh, increase cooperation in the maritime issues, but also uh, realizing free and open in the Pacific. You know, the country that we've uh, now come up several times, but we haven't touched on directly, of course, is China, sort of a motivating factor, not just for uh, this summit and these trilateral meetings, but previous trilateral meetings as well. Um, Emma, I guess I'll start with you here. Uh, when it comes to uh, China, how big of a factor is that in driving um, these increased cooperations between the US and Japan and Korea, the US, Japan and the Philippines? Um, how much of it is China's pressure versus U.S. pressure? The China's rise um, economically and militarily, of course, it, it is the issue um, in the Indo-Pacific and driving a lot of this cooperation. Um, this is the one I worked before this job. I worked for about 20 years at the Congressional Research Service, um, so really saw a swell of um, concern about China over those years. Um, this is one of the only areas where Congress has some agreement across um, partisan lines, um, which may not be um, the best thing. It's for different you know, different motivations. Sometimes it's human rights, sometimes it's security. So, um, a lot of it is economic at this point. Um, but this is um, really, um, you know, it's sort of united at least the U.S. Congress, um, and 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 obviously this this White House has also been um, concerned, but trying to stabilize that relationship, um, sometimes against the tide of, of a lot of anti-Chinese sentiment. And Consul General, uh, when it comes to Japan-China relations, it's one thing for the U.S. to be you know, sort of hawkish and aggressive toward China, but China and Japan are next door neighbors and have been for forever, basically. Could you talk a little bit about where uh, Japan-China relations differ from that of the U.S.-China relationship? I don't think there is much difference, but as you said, geographically speaking, Japan is a neighbor to China, and also we have a history with China. But uh, the, if I may the, put you in a kind of perspective of how we see the challenge posed by China, some people compare the recent the challenge posed by China as the same as the challenge posed by the uh, Soviet Union in the last century. The, many people say how to deal with China is the biggest challenge of this century, just as the, how to deal with Soviet Union was the biggest challenge in the last century. But the big difference, Soviet Union was just a one-dimensional power, military power. But today China is the 
second largest world economy closely integrated into the world economy. So uh, Japan and the United States, as I see it, not seeking kind of a confrontation with China, as I, we seek stability, especially st the stable economic relation with China. And also we are not trying to uh, isolate China, rather we are trying to constructively engage China. And also uh, in the field of the so-called uh, economic securities, like uh, to uh, strengthen supply chains and the increase our resilience of our economies. Japan and the United States are not seeking a kind of a decouple Japan, US economy completely from Chinese economy. As uh, we are seeking uh, the risk of our vital economic interest. The, given the, the current Chinese uh, economic uh, the status in the world economy and the global integrated world economy, uh, I complete the decoupling Japan, US economy from Chinese economies is rather impractical. I have one thing, yeah, um, please do. Just, just of interest in this upcoming week. I'm um, very curious about exactly how Prime Minister Kishida addresses and, and speaks about China, particularly in the um, address before a joint meeting of Congress, um, because that's obviously an area, as I just said, where there's a lot of bipartisan agreement. But Japan also tends to be um, a little less aggressive in its language when it's talking about China, particularly in that high profile um, of an environment. So I, it'll be interesting to see. It's sort of an easy applause line, but it's also something that Japan doesn't tend to do, um, speak aggressively about China even if it's in the backdrop of, of their strategic considerations. So if there's bipartisan consensus in Congress, is there also some bipartisan consensus among the American public when it comes to China? Yeah, there is. Um, for the most part, I would say it wasn't always that way. Uh, for a while there, we would see in our surveys, we also conduct something called an uh, elite survey, which is survey among business leaders, academics, experts in think tank community and government, and a range of people. And when they initially kind of, we saw that there was a spike in among those leader surveys, we call them. Um, I don't know what year was that, like 2017-ish uh, for J China becoming a critical threat. And we didn't see it really among the public. And then we saw, we heard people like Mitt Romney talking about currency manipulation. That was before that, but then we also, heard Trump um, really uh, railing against China's trade practices. And then we saw the Republicans among the public really rising in terms of considering China a threat. And then uh, now really Democrats have also increased their concern about China. A lot of it is economic. Uh, some of it is military, but they still see the U.S. as uh, the dominant military power. But economically, it's more of a mixed bag. Um, but there is a pretty, I would say there's a pretty wide margin for what the U.S. government could do. I'm not saying it should do, because I think we need something more along the lines of when we had the Soviet Union, where we would cooperate on arms control measures, or we would cooperate on some issues. At the same time, we didn't agree on things like human rights. I, I personally, I think that's what we need, but I think the U.S. public now is pretty concerned about China, about supply chains, COVID, also um, compounded some of these concerns and uh, also a concern about human rights. You know, speaking on, of supply chains, one of the ways the Biden administration's tried to address this is through, you know, friend shoring and ally shoring of, well, we're gonna bring these supply chains fully within, you know, friendly and allied countries and we'll give sort of some preferential treatments and some investment opportunities. But that is also running up against some election year politics this year. Um, the uh, proposed acquisition of U.S. Steel by Nippon Steel has run into some objections from lawmakers, from people in Pennsylvania, and potentially even from the president. Um, Emma, do, is this a one-off election problem, or is this a deeper problem between stated desires of the administration and sort of some more cutthroat economic protectionism? Well, being in an election cycle doesn't help. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually puzzled by the timing on Nippon Steel's part. Um, it seems like uh, not the, the, the best moment. Um, and it's unfortunately something that gets traction on the left and the right um, 
from, uh, you know, from both um, uh, both presidential candidates, for example. So it's not a great combination there. Um, Pennsylvania, you know, is a, is a major swing state. It's going to have a contentious Senate um, race as well. Um, so I think that during the visit, they're going to try and sidestep this issue as much as possible. I um, mean, Biden had to make his statement on it. Um, although Biden's statement was very much focused on U.S. workers and U.S. labor, and obviously he's been very associated with that constituency for a long time. The senators that are calling for an investigation have pointed to Chinese security concerns, even though that's a small, as I understand it, I'm not an expert in the steel industry at all, um, he's in a very small percentage of, of, of the work that Nifon Steel does. So um, it's an interesting dynamic. I'm sure they're gonna, the reporters are going to try and nail them on these questions to the extent that they have press availability. Um, but it is sort of, um, it can be seen as a moment where U.S. goes on and on about French shoring, um, but can we really walk the walk? Council General, the perspective from Tokyo on this? I mean, the U.S. steel acquisition yes. by Nippon Steel. Well, the, I think it, I, all I can say is that it is uh, the matter between Japanese private company and U.S. private company. So as a government official, I wish to refrain from making comment on this. But uh, I want to share with you just one comment from uh, uh, one governor whom I met uh, a couple months ago. He said that the, uh, he, uh, he's not nervous about this one. And he said the, uh, he would say his colleagues that this is not, a, this is acquisition, a propose, proposal of acquisition by a trusted uh, partner companies, Japanese companies, by the most trusted allies. So he said that. So I want to just share that comment with you. Yeah. And of course, the Midwest, as I think we're going to hear about on our second panel, the Midwest is home to a lot of Japanese foreign direct investment. Um, I imagine governors are generally very happy to hear uh, the Japanese calling on uh, them in their state houses. We are going to move to Q&A in just a few minutes. I'll remind you we have a microphone in the center aisle where you can queue up and ask questions. Or you can also go online, open your browser, and type in ccga.live to submit your questions online. I'll get them up here on the iPad. And of course, if you're watching online, that's how you'd ask your questions too. Before we go to Q&A though, I'm going to jump in and ask one um, based on some of our polling actually. So a couple of years ago, the council and the Japan Institute for International Affairs conducted some joint research in the US and Japan. And one of the things we were really interested in looking at was uh, these in, in crisis scenarios, right? In the event of a crisis, how willing and interested is the Japanese public in providing some of this aid to US forces? And what we found is that Japan really does not want to get, or the Japanese public does not want to get involved in these conflicts. Um, and as we've seen from uh, our own polling in the US, the American public is also a little concerned about getting involved in a potential conflict between Japan and China. At the same time, this is really now on the agenda for uh, both the US and Japanese governments. How can alliance leaders in both countries better prepare their public for the possibility of a crisis? I know it's a hard one, but you can, anyone can jump in there. Uh, it's tricky, um, I would say. Um, in Japan's case, um, you know, I think there's long been sort of a gap between where the public is and where the elites are, particularly in terms of, of um, defending Japan's security and the, and the, the, the rise of, of concerns about China. Um, and I, for a long time, you know, there's, deep strains of pacifism in, in the Japanese public. And when I would talk to you know, defense managers, um, it was really notable how different it was than the people that, that polling showed and that my own conversations um, with friends in Japan showed. Um, I think the Japanese public has moved um, a bit. And um, my observation was that it particularly moved the dial after um, Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, that was a sort of really shook Japan in a way, just seeing um, a, um, that sort of aggression. Um, so it seemed to me that the polling moved towards Japanese being more supportive of putting more resources 
towards their own defense after that. Um, it wasn't the only thing. The DPRK is regularly flying missiles um, in their direction. Um, the Chinese military exercises have become sort of a new normal um, around Taiwan, particularly since the Pelosi visit. So I think that the Japanese public is increasingly seeing that they live in sort of a dangerous neighborhood. And um, and some of that, that the deep-seated pacifism has given away to a, a practical um, you know, um, acceptance of, of spending more. Um, well, actually, I don't know the number, exact number of the, po of the public polling, but I just want to follow up your comment. The, uh, for maybe for the last couple of years, Japan has upgraded our national uh, security strategy or national security architecture as a whole, the fundamentally increasing uh, the, our defense capabilities, also committed to doubling our defense budget up to 2% of GDP by the year of 2027. And also Japan has been uh, intensified our diplomatic uh, the, uh, engagement, the fostering the global network of uh, like-minded countries, like uh, chairing G7 countries throughout the last year, the Quad, Japan, US, India, Australia, and trilateral cooperation, Japan, ROK, US, and also uh, so-called uh, South, the global South countries. So these are our efforts uh, have been very much, uh, I think, appreciated by the United States. So in a sense, we are uh, up to the uh, high expectation by the United States as a close ally. Yeah. yeah, I'd just add that there is a difference too between asking people a question about a hypothetical situation and when the situation really becomes live. Like I would say, for the American case, it was 43% say they would support using U.S. troops if China were to initiate a military conflict with Japan over the Senkakus or whatever islands. Um, that's not peanuts, 43% starting somewhere. And then once, you know, if it really did happen, the media is going to play a role. Uh, our leaderships on both sides of the, you know, Congress will be making arguments. So that will move opinion too as well. So I just wanted to point out that it's one thing to ask about a cold, uh, maybe this will happen in the future versus when you see pictures streaming uh, online or on the news, then it, it, it can have an effect on public opinion. Yeah, I think we've seen both in the cases of Ukraine and Gaza just yeah. how much opinion can shift quickly when the situation goes from being a hypothetical to being something that's very real. Exactly. All right, so I am going to shift over into Q&A, and it looks like we've got some folks queued up for the microphone. So please step forward, uh, state your name, and ask a question. Thank you, Alex Caruso. So we're talking about security. I'm curious to learn more of the future of the partnership between Japan and U.S., and Emma, that network you mentioned of bilats and trilats is about a new dimension of security in cyber and China containment on cyber threats and even election interference or other things. The sort of the future of conflict looks very different and how will this relationship evolve? Sure. Um, in terms of the future of um, the U.S.-Japan partnership, um, and cyber is a component of this, a growing um, component. Um, of, of cooperation. Um, <laughs> I think that for all of these, we call them mini laterals um, that are developing in the Indo-Pacific, the U.S.-Japan alliance is really sort of the, the, the center, the core of them. Japan's involved in all of them, the United States is involved in all of them. So it's really, it's known as the cornerstone of peace and security um, in the region. So that has been um, sort of the pillar um, to develop these other things. Um, and as we have said, the relationship in the alliance is very strong right now. Um, I do think there's some anxiety surrounding that, though. However strong um, the, the relationship is now, there's sort of a rush to institutionalize things right now. And I think it's, you know, no, no, um, it, it would be foolish not to acknowledge that, that a lot of that has to do with U.S. politics and specifically the U.S. presidential election. Um, I mean, Trump, when he was president, was not shy about being skeptical about the value of U.S. alliances overseas. Um, Japan did better than some of our other alliances in terms of the rhetoric that came out of the White House when he was president. But I think there is a pretty high degree of concern in Tokyo that some of these advancements in any number of areas, in quantum, in cyber, in terms of, of, of the change in command structure, 
probably going to see some announcements about that coming out of the White House um, next week, um, that, that that could be downgraded, particularly if there's a demand for Japan to give considerably more in terms of our burden sharing arrangements. Um, so um, the jury is still out on where that relationship goes, and a lot of it depends on, on who's elected in November. I'm Carson Keller. My question has more to do with the uh, trilateral aspect of the high-level discussion that will be taking place in between the leaders of Japan, the Philippines, and the United States. And I actually wanted to address the Philippines' role in this. And it, this question is geared primarily towards Consul General Yanagi, though I would welcome the input of everyone on the panel to the degree that they can. Namely, what, um, what, strate what strategic security cooperation will look like between Japan and the Philippines uh, going forward. I know this in particular that um, Japan has been very helpful in particular providing ships to the Philippine Coast Guard and other uh, military and civilian assets um, in the Philippines currently. Well, as I said in the previous my remarks, the, the, I, I just want to repeat that the Japan-US alliance and US-Philippine alliance and both Japan-Philippine uh, maritime countries. And as you said, for the last several years, Japan has been uh, the contributing to further build up your, uh, the Philippines' capabilities in, deal in dealing with the maritime challenge. Also, Philippines and Japan are sharing the basic values, democratic countries. So we are the uh, close partners in realizing uh, the free and open in the Pacific. But if I may share with you just my personal experience, more than nearly 30 years ago, I was a desk officer in charge of Japan Philippine relations, 1994 to 1995, 67, something like that. At that time, Philippine hosted uh, Manila Subic Epic, 1996. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, just after Osaka Epic meeting. So at that time, we are the close partners in realizing free and open trade and investment. And I visited Philippines uh, many, many times in the preparation of that leaders meeting up to the Subic leaders meeting. So uh, given that uh, my experience, I'm very much delighted to see this uh, trilateral uh, leaders meeting on April 11th in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Twain Deskins, and thank you again for your really informed comments. I had a question, I was talking to a family member on this very topic yesterday, and there is a deep sense in this country of isolationism, pre-World War II and, and earlier. Everybody seems to be of a mind of either party that we're going to spend on defense. You haven't heard people saying, no money for defense. But it's who you're going to defend with the money you spend on defense that seems to be the issue both in Japan as well as in the United States. And so I was wondering to see if you could at least speak to that issue of the inherent in isolationism in our country and our willingness to defend people who are attacked, who are not Americans. Dina, do you want to start with the sort of where the American polling is on that? Yeah, I can start on some of it. Um, so <clears throat> a, a, a lot of it depends on who is doing the attacking as well as well, first of all, let me say, isolationism is a word that gets thrown all around a lot. And I wouldn't, I know it's, we, every year, people, journalists and other people contact us and want to hear about isolationism. And it's not really isolationism. It's more uh, what we're seeing in our data and have seen since, you know, 74 when we started doing this, is that it's a reluctance to put our primary focus on military interventions and military assets and rather we should be doing a lot more diplomatically or in trade or in non-combative types of things. So that's where I would just kind of try to define it a little differently. Um, but we, and we actually have seen, I would say, a rise in willingness to commit U.S. troops rather than a retreat over the like past five decades, I would say, mm -hmm. thinking in a lot of, if you look over time at some of our trends. But yeah, so 
if it is China that is the aggressor, Americans do recognize that that would be a really formidable adversary um, on a battlefield, and so they generally would like to avoid that. Um, they generally felt the same about Russia, and then we saw when Russia invaded Ukraine, not so much, they, uh, still a majority of uh, Americans decidedly do not want to get involved militarily in Ukraine, putting our own boots on the ground, but, you know, a pretty bare majority of about about half of Americans say we should help Ukraine out, um, given the invasion by Russia. So those are like the two adversaries where they do it. And then there are reasons why people will um, will support the use of force or not. If it's something that's a direct, really easy humanitarian issue, people, Americans are fully behind it. If it's something that is can be done with drone strikes or airstrikes and then we're in and out quickly, Americans are okay with that. If it's for a, a just cause, if it's for like, uh, you know, preventing a genocide or if there's a clear aggression that is in our, that is affecting us, or our allies. So I think we're kind of running out of time, but it's a little complicated, but I guess my takeaway is I wouldn't consider it isolationist, but yes, there are times when Americans see the need for the use of force and there's some, there are many other times where they think we have to be very careful with that. Yeah, if you're interested more in seeing uh, sort of how this debate plays out in the American public, I would recommend you check out our 2023 Chicago Council Survey report. We have some copies on the tables in the back. Uh, and sign up for, for our future reports. This is an issue that we've been looking at for almost five decades now and hope we will continue to look at uh, in the years to come. That's about all the time we have for our first panel. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists, uh, Emma, Council General Yanagi, and Dina Smells. <laughs> We're gonna take a 10 minute break. Uh, please get some refreshments in the back while we prepare for our film screening. Thank you.
This is so formal. <laughs> um, hello and good afternoon to everyone. And I want to say thank you very much to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs for having me and of course the US Japan Foundation for supporting my films and making them possible. Um, I just want to say really briefly that you're going to see a film called Baseball Behind Barbed Wire. And it is about the World War II Japanese American incarceration, but told through the baseball lens. But I want to explain to you kind of where it came from. The film that US Japan Council has, or US Japan Foundation has funded is called Diamond Diplomacy. And it is a, a longer film. It's a feature length documentary about US Japan relations through baseball, which encompasses at this point 152 years of history. And inside that was a little bit about this World War II Japanese American incarceration. And I was kind of felt like mm, maybe it should have its own film. So then the National Parks Foundation came in and gave me money to turn it into a short film. And it was a short film. So it, it got finished first. And it's been out now for, I don't know, six, eight months. And I'm very happy to be able to present it to this group. And thank you very much for having me in the film. And I will be up here talking some more later. We weren't supposed to actually go beyond that barbed wire fence, but my dad says, I'm gonna build a ballpark there. A very difficult time for Japanese Americans. They had to spend four years incarcerated in these camps, you know, concentration camp with guard towers, barbed wire, machine guns pointed inward. And they'd see these brown windstorms coming towards them. The dust storms were so intense. When Pearl Harbor happened, the FBI came and took my father away. I remember had a Bob our friends uh, over six feet tall. The trauma, the humiliation that most went through, the denying of your constitutional rights, your civil liberties. Baseball was a way that Japanese Americans could find some kind of normalcy. It's just astounding that they kept the all-American pastime alive, even from behind Bob wire. to our history, you see how passionate and how long uh, Japanese Americans as well as Japanese nationals have uh, endured and loved the game. We have very proudly four and possibly five generations of baseball in our family. My grandfather, Hisataro, uh, had two sons. 
and my Uncle Johnny became like the Nisei Babe Ruth or the Shohei Otani in the 20s and 30s. Baseball was introduced to Japan in 1872 by a school teacher named Horace Wilson. So he went to a university there uh, to teach and he brought a baseball bat and a ball with him. To have nine players playing with one mind, it took off like wildfire. In Japan, the Japanese feel that it's their pastime as, as strongly as, as we feel it's ours. The Issei were fanatical, passionate about baseball. That passion that the Issei developed as kids in Japan carried over once they came to America. It was a farming community, Guadalupe, California. There was a lot of Japanese that lived over there. Baseball was played every Sunday. Father would pack up the kids and we all end up at the baseball diamond. It was universal. It didn't matter what your skin color was, your faith, what country you came from. I think all the immigrants wanted to prove that they were the best in this sport. Putting on a baseball uniform was like putting on the American flag. They couldn't play in Major League Baseball because of the Jim Crow laws, but the Latinos had their leagues, the All-American Girls, the Negro Leagues, what we called the Nisei Leagues. They were able to play each other. However, the war breaks out and everything falls apart. We lived in a little community called Betarabia. After Pearl Harbor, the kids would be playing in the front yard and every morning we would see this army trucks with a truckload of soldiers sitting on the back of the truck and they were going westward. We lived in an old schoolhouse. My father was a farmer. He was one of the first to get picked up by the FBI, too. They accused my dad of sending the Morse code. Back those days, we used the outhouse. And so seven people living in the house, you could just about imagine how many times we went in and went out. And that's every time that we did that, we flicked the light on, we flicked the light off. So that kept on night after night and we didn't know that the FBI was watching. When Pearl Harbor happened, the FBI came and took my father away and accused him of sending messages to the Japanese submarines. ordered to take whatever you can carry and usually it was two suitcases and in these two containers I took all my worldly belongings. Here in Fresno, the line of demarcation was the 99 highway. So west of the highway, they would go to Arkansas. East of the highway, they go to Arizona. Our family had to go to Arkansas, incarcerated for almost four years. There were 14 barracks to a block. And I think there were about 250 people that were living in that one block. I still remember my address. Block 28, 
13C. When the war broke out, I think the beginning of the 1942 season, Commissioner Landis had written a letter to the president saying that they were considering canceling the season. FDR wrote back and said, uh, no, baseball needs to continue. People will be working harder. They need some sort of enjoyment or relief or outlet, if you will. And so that's the role that baseball played for the greater community. And intuitively, when the incarceration occurred, that's one of the first things that the Japanese American community turned to as well. There was somebody in each location of the 10 incarceration camps, building fields and establishing leagues. All the camps had baseball fields. I like to use example of Gila River as one of the A baseball team camps. Manzanar had the San Fernando Aces, which was a juggernaut of pre-war championship baseball. There was Jerome, Arkansas, where they had tremendous ball players at a semi-pro level. Known as Coach Denny, always with respect and love. Man, strict but gentle. Kenichi Zenimura, who was like the father of Japanese American baseball in California, and they used to call him the Dean of the Diamond. Early 1920, he built the pre-war Japanese ballpark here in Fresno. Kenichi Zenimura was born in 1900 in Hiroshima, Japan. He moved to Hawaii around age seven. Baseball in Hawaii in the early 1900s was a really multicultural hotbed of great baseball activity. He went to the mainland in 1920 to go play baseball. October 29th, 1927, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig were barnstorming through California and they had scheduled a game at Fresno's Fireman's Ballpark. They asked the local community to gather all of your top players to play with Babe and Lou, and they split into two teams. Zenimura was picked along with three of his teammates, and they played with the Larrapin Lou's, and they ended up defeating Babe Ruth's team. I talked with Howard Zenimura, and he was telling me that on Sunday morning, December 7th, he and his brothers were in a uh, gymnasium playing basketball. And they went into the game, everything was great. And when they came out of the game, everybody was quiet. People, you know, there were murmurs of maybe something was going on. And of course, Pearl Harbor had happened while they were playing the basketball game. Life really turned upside down for the Zenimir family and really everyone in that situation. He had owned 50% uh, ownership of a Studebaker dealership in Fresno. And Zenny had to sell his share of the business. They lost their home. They had to sell all of their belongings. They could only take what they could carry. Of course, he brought his baseball gear. When the war broke out, I thought he would be one of the first ones that would be picked up. He's not an American citizen. Fortunately, uh, he wasn't one of those people that uh, the FBI were looking for. In fact, we were so scared that Anything that was Japanese, we, you know, we kind of got rid of it. 120,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry were basically rounded up, put into uh, county fairgrounds for six months while they built the permanent camps throughout the United States. When we left our hometown and we went to the Tulare Fairground Assembly Center, this is what we were confronted with. These were old stables. They housed horses for many years. But when they found out the Japanese were coming here, they chased the horses out, and they shoved the Japanese into these horse stables. So you just think about it right now, and you think, gee, this is just a stench of inhumanity. During World War II, Kenichi Zenimura built his second ballpark at the Fresno Fairgrounds. 
recruits tractors and players to level out the ground at the assembly center. Then they boarded their trains to go to the desert wastelands. My mom told me the story that once they got on the train to take a train ride to Jerome, Arkansas, there were blinders on the train, so you couldn't see in or out, but she lifted it just a, a skosh to see the uh, racists and the bigots with their signs that said, get out of Fresno, never come back to California. And so my mom, being very concerned, she asked my bachan, you know, what's going to happen to us in these camps? Is it going to be like in Germany and what the Jewish culture has to go through? She goes, oh, no, no. She goes, this is the greatest country in the world. All immigrants have to pay a price. We will go and prove how loyal we are and come back. Being incarcerated was traumatic, it was humiliating. Camp life was hard, but people tried to create a community. Kids went to school, people went to work, and they did all the jobs required to keep the camp running, for which they were given very modest pay. I remember my dad does the town plumber. I think he said he was only making about $12 a month. This is actually one of the blocks of Gila camp. They had 13 barracks, one mess hall, one laundry room. There was no washing machine. You had to wash everything by hand. There was no privacy. It was just like a gang shower, you know, the, the one that you see in service. I, got, I learned a new word, latrine, at that time. And the toilet, well, the latrine was wide open. There was no partition. Zandemir went to Gila River and really made a positive impact on the community where he lived. But it wasn't positive at first. He's human, and when he got here, he was depressed. I heard that he didn't unpack for a couple weeks. One night, he was looking off into the distance beyond the barbed wire, and he kind of envisioned a field out there. And he told his wife, uh, Kyoko, that he was gonna build another baseball field. Zenimura Field, Gila Camp, finest pastime, 70 years past. Kenichi Zenimura built his third field of dreams on the middle of a Pima Indian reservation with a grass infield, grass outfield, castor bean home run fence from left to right field, they would chalk the foul lines with flour. It was ironically on the outside of the bob wire. Well, where were we gonna run to? There was two or 300 miles of desert in every direction. We had about 10 of our young guys that were interested in baseball start digging what they call sagebrush on the desert. He found a farmer who had a tractor, and they were able to scrape the field and make it flat. And then from there, it was just piecemealing it together. We went to the lumber yard and, uh, and stole some lumber, a two by four. He took a 300 foot water line from the laundry room to the pitcher's mound so that they could water the infield. He recruited the camp fire department to test out their water hoses to make sure the outfield was nice and green. Uh, the castor bean home run fence looked like it was Wrigley Field. They had 32 teams and three divisions just at Gila River, Arizona. Camp director Bennett was very supportive of baseball at Gila River. He even threw out the first pitch for the opening game. I think it was mainly the camp directors, how they felt about the game and how it could promote a positivity and goodwill 
for is the internees or the so-called enemy aliens. As you went into the game, you would drop in your coins or whatever you could afford to support the teams. The mothers and the women would take mattress ticking to make uniforms. Tets Furukawa's mom would make sliding pads. I'm sure that most of all the parents, they were worried about the kids, hoping that they don't join gangs. I think that we owe a lot to Howard Zanimura's father. He encouraged all the youngsters to come and practice baseball, play baseball, and gave everyone hope, joy, and normalcy to their lives. Zenimira used the game of baseball to break down barriers throughout his entire life. From 1923, when their anti-Japanese sentiment was really high in California, there were signs that would say, no Japanese allowed. And he would go into that town and try to schedule games and they would play. And eventually over time, the signs would disappear. Arizona was very strong with the baseball talent. The top semi-pro team was called the Phoenix Compress Team, and they were a Negro League team. They worked at a, what's called a compress factory, which is where they processed the cotton, and he invited them to come and play. But when you think about the broader picture of what was happening at that point in time, you have this African-American team going into an Indian reservation to play Japanese Americans incarcerated behind barbed wire. My grandmother died at the Jerome, Arkansas camp. In our culture, the Buddhist culture, we cremate our elders that went before us. And they didn't have a crematory at the Jerome, Arkansas camp. So they sent her body to Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And a few months later, my mother gets a Folgers coffee can indicating this was her mother's ashes. So she opened up the lid and on top of my grandmother's ashes was a piece of paper that my mom thought it was her name. So she opened up the paper and all it said on it was Jap woman. And so the, uh, the inhumanities didn't even really stop with her death. July 1943, Japanese Americans in the camps were forced to answer the loyalty questionnaire. Basically asked their allegiance to America and if they were loyal to the country, would they be willing to fight for a country? Where some people wrote yes, yes, others wrote no, no. You're denouncing your Japanese citizenship. For many Issei, that was their only citizenship. They weren't allowed to become U.S. citizens. So that's why some of them would say no. They call them the no-no boys. And they were sent to Tule Lake in California, and Tule Lake was a higher maximum security camp. So that questionnaire really broke up families, it broke up friendships. What Sandemira did was really interesting during this time, he turned to baseball again. And before the camps and the families were split up, he held a three-game series, the Yes Yeses versus the No Nos. The first game, the Yes Yeses won. And the second one, the No Nos won. And so it comes down to this third game, and right before they played, they canceled it. Uh, they decided that it was probably the best thing for it to just remain tied one-to-one. -one. Then he, he ended up saying yes. So at this point, he denounced his Japanese citizenship. So from 1943 to 1952, Zenimura is a man really with no country. By 1944, some of the camp teams were allowed to travel to other camps to compete. Gila had three different teams come into Gila to play. 
Heart Mountain Cave. There was another camp called Amachi and Poston. And I know that my dad tried to raise money for these teams to come to Gila. It's amazing what he did to try and see if he can raise his money. If you look at the grandstand, it was section A, B, C, and those people that donated money, <laughs> he would give them the best seat. And then in 1944, Zenimer was able to take his all-star team up to Heart Mountain. When I was 17 years old, when the Gila team visited Heart Mountain, Wyoming, with a, another relocation camp that was about 1,500 miles. We rode a rickety Santa Fe Trailway bus, and it probably took us two days to get there. Some of the seats were worn out, and you couldn't sleep because the springs are pushing you up. We were accosted by Caucasians. They looked at us, and they knew that we were Japanese, and they said, what are you guys doing over here? We just left the internment camp in Arizona. But because of the war effort and there's a lack of labor, we're going to Montana and Wyoming to help with the potato and the sugar beet harvest. They said, oh yeah, well that sounds good, Bob. So they let us go. To be able to take a road trip from Gila River, Arizona, all the way to Heart Mountain, Wyoming, or to Amachi, Colorado, these so-called enemy aliens had this amnesty in a way. You could take a bus, get on a train, and travel thousands of miles away for a tournament. Towards the end of the war, Zenny coached the high school baseball team. He arranged a match between the Gila River Eagles with the two-time state champions, the Tucson Badgers. Hanley Slago was their coach, who was an ex-San Francisco SEAL. Hanley Slago said, we'll come into your camp, play one game. After that game, you come over to Tucson High and we'll have the return match. Kenichi said, absolutely. They start the game and it's like a boxing match, you know, each round slugging it out uh, and they go the full game and it ends up being tied in, in nine innings, 10 all. Eagles, bases loaded. Harvey Zenimura comes up to the plate, takes three straight balls, two straight strikes, and on the sixth pitch, he rips it for the walk-off win. And there were thousands of people watching this game. They all ran onto the field. It was pandemonium, as Tetsuro Kawa would say. I pitched the whole 10 innings, and people asked me, how many pitches did you throw? And I said, I can't remember. I kind of thought that maybe I threw 155 pitches because they were hitting my balls all over the field. They come to an agreement that they're going to have a rematch, but this time down in Tucson. Word started to spread in the Tucson community that the Japanese-American players were coming. The Tucson community uh, didn't want these so-called enemy alien kids to play in their community. So that was kind of a, a hurtful thing for Kenichi and the Eagles because they wanted the return match. In 1945, Zenimura Field closes along with the rest of the Gila River camps, and the Zenimuras eventually returned back to Fresno. The difficulties of resettlement was harsh. Most lost their homes and businesses. I remember my mom getting off at the train station in Sacramento and a lady telling her, how dare you come back to California? My dad in the little small town couldn't even buy gas at the local station for a while. Most of the Nisei went back to their high schools and they played baseball. Resettlement also meant that they could get their tournaments and their road trips and community to community games started again. And then in 1952, 
Issei or first-generation Japanese Americans could apply for U.S. citizenship. Kenichi was very excited about becoming a U.S. citizen. He studied really hard. He passed and he was a proud Japanese American. Kenichi referred his boys to the Hiroshima Carp and they played professional ball. Howard only one season. Harvey played four, was a two-time all-star. Gila Camp Sunset, glorious colored spanning, desolate desert. Baseball kept us alive as far as I was concerned. Otherwise, I would have been probably a juvenile delinquent over there. <laughs> because we were only, only uh, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old. We need to show the positive aspects of our history and the negative. And I think when we talk about incarceration during World War II, it's such a negative subject matter because America imprisoned their own Americans only because of their race. And we can't learn from history or we can't heal unless we acknowledge the mistakes that we've made. It's amazing what the family went through, but myself, I think that we have to have forgiveness in our heart. I know when I was young, of course, I didn't like what the United States did to us in our own country, et cetera. But I don't have that much time left, and I think that this word forgiveness means a lot to us as we grow old. And if we don't have any forgiveness in our hearts, we won't have a peaceful end when we leave this earth.
So, um, well, first, uh, just thank you again, Yuriko Gamo Romer, for a fabulous, fabulous film. Another round of applause for such a moving and touching um, documentary. Um, so Yuriko is part of a, this panel is a more eclectic one than the other. So we have Yuriko, as you know, filmmaker, Ryan Christie, uh, teacher of Japanese at uh, Elk Grove High School, um, right. runs an exchange program. Teresa Kolchak is executive director, Japan American Society of Indiana. Um, and the diversity of this panel is intentional. It's designed to show the diverse and evolving aspects of the bilateral relationship beyond the politics, security, and diplomacy that we had heard about in the earlier panel. And I should note that the biden Kashida summit next week is as much about these so-called soft issues as the hard ones that were covered earlier. Um, one of the major initiatives to be announced by the two leaders is a new education exchange endowment, uh, which our organization is, is actually supporting as a founding sponsor. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, after visiting uh, Washington, Prime Minister Kishida is going to North Carolina to tout the remarkable surge of Japanese investment in the US. Uh, and while I'm not sure that baseball will be on the agenda there, <laughs> I should note for those of us who are sitting in the audience that um, this coming weekend, the Los Angeles Dodgers, the new favorite team of Japan, is is coming to Chicago, uh, and the Japanese star uh, Yamamoto star pitcher will be starting on Saturday for the Dodgers, and the Cubs star pitcher Imanaga will be starting on Sunday for the Cubs. Um, and uh, what's interesting in terms of this cultural aspect is, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, and I'm not. I guess Indiana doesn't have a team, but but Japan American societies around the country are now having special Japan days in conjunction with Dodgers visits. And so later this month in Washington, when the Dodgers play the Washington Nationals, they're going to have a special Japan day there. And so that just shows the, the, the power of that. Um, I want to start with each of you by hearing about the different strands of the relationship that you each represent. And then hopefully over the course of this conversation, we'll try and weave those together. And so um, starting, I guess, with Yuriko, uh, tell us a little bit about your origin story with baseball and with this documentary. What made you decide to focus your efforts on that film? Well, thank you, everybody, for watching my film. Um, so Diamond Diplomacy, which is the feature-length film, all started because I have a friend named Dave Dempsey, whose father was a pitcher for the San Francisco Seals. And the Seals were a minor league team before the Giants went to the West Coast. Um, and he went to Japan in 1949 as part of a diplomatic, MacArthur sent the San Francisco Seals during the occupation. And I knew nothing about this until this exhibit. And not only did he, did Con Dempsey go to Japan, but he brought a movie camera with him. And so I got to see these home movies that he had taken while he was in Japan. And I thought, oh, that's my next film. And then of course, as we do, I started opening the history books and realized that baseball had been in Japan for, since 1872. And, then Babe Ruth went, and there were, there were so, all, so much. All of a sudden, it was like, uh-oh, this film is getting unwieldy. <laughs> so it's actually been in production for 10 years. But I do have to say that the U.S.-Japan Foundation was one of the first. I think you were the first funder. And so I'm very, very grateful that the film has been moving along. Thank you to... U.S. Japan Foundation. And I guess we should ask you when we're going to see it. Since, no, I'm just kidding. It's, it's being <laughs> edited right now, and I, I, I have a feeling there's probably a text or two saying, what about this, and what about that? So it's and, happening. Okay, and, and tell us, you, you had said that the reason you're aiming to release it uh, next year yes, is because... Okay. So I am working really hard to get this film completed this year and out in the world for next year, 2025, when everyone is anticipating that... Ichiro Suzuki will be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. And I just think the that first the, Japanese player. And he will be the first Japanese player to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And it's a everyone's pretty sure that he's going to be a no brainer. It'll be a first so, ballot. Yeah. So, so, Ryan, tell us you have your own interesting journey. I mean, from Elk Grove to Elk Grove, but right. journeys in between. Tell us about how and why you got involved with Japan in the first place. Okay, so I am from the Chicagoland area. I live in the suburbs. About 45 minutes away from here is Elk Grove Village. We're really close to the airport, uh, O'Hare Airport, which means there's quite a few Japanese companies, um, which means there's Japanese employees and all the, in the area around Elk Grove and Arlington Heights, that area, um, you'll find 
a lot of Japanese stores. You'll find the Japanese restaurants. So the the community has always been there. And because of that, the closeness to the community, um, Elk Grove High School is one of the few schools that offers Japanese. So as a student, I took it. I was interested, seeing it in the community, seeing it around. And um, we are also very lucky to have just finished up the 35th Japanese exchange program with our sister schools in Ashikaga, in Tochigi. It's um, Ashi Daifu and Ashi Tanfu, they're called. Um, and we've been with the same schools for all 35 years. And I went as a student on year 10 of that exchange program, and I obviously liked it enough to come back and run back, the show. Back, back running it. Thank you. Wow. Teresa, um, speaking 35 years, you are marking your 35 years with the Japan American Society of Indiana, or Indi Indianapolis? Indiana. Indiana. Indiana, the full state. You have yeah. the whole territory. The whole state. So 35 years ago, why did you decide that you wanted to be engaged with the U.S.-Japan relationship in that way. My story, my origin story, started about six years before that when I graduated from university. And I was not a Japanese major, but really interested in Buddhism, Christian, comparative studies. But I never expected that I would go to Japan. Um, was invited as an English teacher, spent three years teaching in Niigata Prefecture, and then moved to Osaka and worked for a Japanese advertising agency in Osaka. So that was six years, came back to Indianapolis and Subaru was just breaking ground in West Lafayette. And the state felt that Indiana needed a bridging organization. At that time, I was very rare having lived in Japan. So right place, right time. And that's the beginning of the story. Got it. So one thing I'm interested in for all of you, and again, this is a theme that we've been trying to stress is that Obviously, the U.S.-Japan relationship has existed for many years, particularly you know, strongly post-war. It's gone through many, many iterations. You've all been involved for a long time. What's changed over time? What, what have you observed differently? And Teresa, I think maybe you want to tee up some slides to, sure, to show us. Sure, sure. So, so, maybe before the oh, slides. Ahead, sure. um, so when Jazzy was first formed, Japan Rick Society of Indiana Jazzy, again, Indiana needed a bridging organization. Subaru was one of the first large companies. And at that time, Hoosiers, people from Indiana, many still had a perception coming from World War II. Japan is the enemy. Um, what does this mean for us with Japanese companies coming into our community? And at the very beginning, um, when we first opened the office, I really wasn't, didn't plan to talk about this, but seeing the movie, um, some of the Japanese companies received bomb threats when they first arrived. So those were some of the calls that this our office what received. Are you talking about? That would have been um, 88, 89, so part of the trade tensions. Um, and I think part of it was the great work that Japanese families did in um, belonging, uh, becoming involved in their communities, and also a role that our organization played. So, All right, so yeah. do you want to now? Sure, I've got some slides. <laughs> ah, there we go. Kind of feel like um, not only talking to the choir, but to the inner circle here. I know all of you are familiar with Japan and the importance of Japanese investment, but just wanted to take a quick look and see what the data is. Um, thanks to our friends at Jetro 2022 data. So Japan is the number one international investor in the United States, um, surpassing the UK, Canada, Germany, and all other countries top in manufacturing investment. And then here we can see um, all the investor countries, just a different look at the same information. Here we have a look at the Midwest, um, the number of Japanese companies. So Illinois has more facilities, almost 700. But if we look at employment, 70,000 for Indiana, 66,000 for Ohio, Indiana and Ohio have the manufacturers, which employ so many more um, Americans. So our employment numbers are, are much higher. So remember, Indiana, 70,000. This is a map that we love to show. And if we look at the first point, um, so 330 plus Japanese manufacturing companies 
per capita based on the population and the amount of Japanese capital investment, Indiana is number one among all 50 states. So it's it's really astounding to think 70,000 Hoosiers employed by Japanese companies, that's actually 1% of Indiana's population are employed by Japanese companies now. So again, when we think back to those early days um, in this really wonderful, broad, deep picture of Japan and Indiana, it's, it's really something. Um, we are a statewide Japan America Society because our companies are in every pocket, every corner of Indiana. We track with them, we follow them. They're the reason that we exist. We partner really closely with local local government, state government, mayor's offices, um, really trying to support the Indiana-Japan relationship at every level. Um, we continue to be a great home for Japanese companies. Um, during the past 10 years, more than 80 new companies have selected us, and we're seeing some really fun new trends in investment. So traditionally, these companies were the traditional automotive parts suppliers. We're seeing a lot more innovation now, um, factory automation, one of the first companies, Hirata, that was in Indiana, even before Subaru, the very first company, they're now a major supplier for Tesla. So that's an exciting story. And then one more example that I really love, this company, it's a startup from Japan. They're based in Iowa, not Indiana. We really wanted them, but they chose Iowa. Um, the Midwest is great for corn, corn agriculture. And for, you know, all these many years, bamboo was the great fiber, the great material. This company called Spiber is using corn to produce clothing and they're even producing car seats. So there's a Toyota LL Bean that has Spiber corn seats. And they are looking for customers in Indiana. We, we really hope they're successful. So we're seeing new types of industry, new types of invest. So I was just going to say um, what's interesting to make your point about the evolution is, so I saw this map, as you know, I met in, in Tokyo with um, the head of the, the Indiana Economic Development Corporation in Tokyo. And I was there with my wife and uh, who also lived, we lived through the Japan trade wars. And she looked at that map and she said, you know, my God, if you'd seen that map 30 years ago, you would have said, you know, Japan is invading Indiana um, to see literally Japanese flags all over the state. And, and, and so, you know, to embrace that, I think is a remarkable statement, which I want to get into maybe a little later about not just what the level of investment is, but how does that change how people view these things. Um, Ryan, I actually wanted to, to turn to you and talk about, you know, you started as a student, you've evolved into someone who's, who is running these things, dealing with a lot of students. What have you seen in terms of the change in reasons why people get interested in Japan, the perspective on Japan from the perspective of, of, of high school students? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I mean, to be perfectly honest, one of the big drivers in interest is anime. Um, and I am benefiting from that uh, because a lot of students sat home for about a year and a half uh, watching Netflix and now so my numbers are blowing up. Um, but <clears throat> also it's, it's again, like the, the visibility of it. We see companies coming in and a lot of students um, are interested in not necessarily pursuing Japanese as a profession, necessarily being a Japanese teacher or anything like that, but they're interested in being um, lawyers and people who like systems engineers, and they're very interested. And they know that essentially that um, they need to learn another language and Japan is pretty interesting to them. Um, but ultimately there is a general feeling of like, globalization. And so my students are trying to catch up on to that and get that 21st century disposition. And why Japan as opposed to Chinese or Spanish or, and talk a little bit about your school district, which I gather is what, 48%? Or Latino? My, my particular school is, uh, we are a <clears throat> majority minority school. So we are about 40, 48% Latino. Um, and so you're you're asking why is Japanese offered? Yeah, or, or yeah, or why yeah. is it of such appeal as opposed to what might be seen as more practical 
languages or more useful languages in that context? Well, one big thing, again, being a minority majority school is that a lot of people already come in speaking Spanish um, at home or just out in their communities. So they're looking for something that is different, something that gives them a little bit of an edge that, that kind of makes them stand out a little bit. Uh, my particular school also offers French and Italian, but again, to a st person who speaks Spanish as their heritage language, taking a non-romance language is a good bet for them. And they also know that it's marketable in the future. Hmm. So one of the things that just thinking about the first panel and the things we talked about that were talked about there, um, in looking at a lot of the really interesting poll, polling numbers that, that Dina presented that shows, you know, American skepticism about, growing skepticism about global engagement. Um, and I suppose that when that question is asked, it's defined really as, you know, should we have troops abroad or alliances or even trade agreements? Um, but Yuriko, we were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, global engagement from the context of something that's not a hard policy, but through baseball. and and. Give us a little bit of that perspective of how even at a time of maybe isolationism, however you want to define it, um, these kind of global ties persist and maybe can offset those. Well, this is exactly what the other film, Diamond Diplomacy, is about, is this history and the relationship that goes back and forth. And and baseball, it, it starts in 1872. So when Japan opens up to the Western world, it gets introduced. And from that point on, it, it becomes very popular very quickly. But it also, it goes through the various points of ups and downs. And of course, the major big thing being World War II in the, in the middle of all this. But there's a point in there where, so the, the relationship between the United States and Japan through Asia and all that is, is becoming tenuous and then all of a sudden Babe Ruth shows up in Japan and everyone is so enamored of Babe Ruth that the the relationship between the two countries starts to look up a little bit and of course that doesn't hold I mean I'm not going to pretend that baseball is going to solve the world peace situation but um but I think it has always somehow stayed there they weren't willing to scrap baseball I mean, there was a point in there when World War II started that they decided all English terminology should be thrown out. So they replaced strike and ball with yosh, dame, good and bad, you know, and they did things like that, but they, but it never went away. And then World War II ends and the occupation happens and baseball becomes a part of this formal di diplomatic maneuver. I mean, it's part of the occupation. And then it also continues through the, I mean, we're talking about those trade wars, you know, it was like, <clears throat> there's still baseball happening in Japan. The first Japanese player came to the United States in 1964. And it was sort of by accident. And so there was a little period of no more Japanese players, 30 years. Um, but then Nomo is the second player. And he shows up at kind of at the tail end of the trade wars. And um, I have one of my experts talking about how the Japanese government used to have this like chart on that, you know, showing the ups and downs of the relationship between the two countries. And it was, it was actually fairly up after the occupation. And, and then he starts talking about the ups and the downs. And, and of course it was down during the, the trade wars, but then all of a sudden 1995, it spikes up again. And he's pretty sure that Nomo coming to the United States made a big difference. So you were telling me before a story also about baseball diplomacy that you'd encountered that Prime Minister Kishida himself uh, told or wrote about recently. Tell us that that version of how that has shaped his views in ways. So I'm from San Francisco and recently they we had the APEC meeting was happening there. So right before the meetings, there was a um, there was an op-ed piece in the paper where he, Prime Minister Kishida actually wrote a letter and, and he was commenting, and it was, I, I remember it was in the second paragraph, that he was living in New York when he was a child, 
I guess, grade school. And that was when Mashi, Masanori Mashi Murakami came to the United States and pitched for the San Francisco Giants in 1964. And so he, he remembers being very moved that a Japanese pitcher was there. And so then he thought, oh, I'm going to go, when I go back to Japan, I'm going to play baseball. And it actually motivated him to play baseball when he went back. And so I, I thought, oh, I wonder if those two have met and they should meet. And, you know, but anyways. <laughs> so, I, Teresa, I want to ask you the question that I, I threw at you to call, but from a slightly different twist, which is, um, and if you don't mind my maybe looking a little bit from a political lens. Um, so as Dina's slide showed, a lot of the skepticism about alliances abroad, you know, are among Republicans and particularly in red states. Indiana is a deep red state. Um, and how does that sort of, how does, how does that balance seem to emerge of a state that has embraced, you know, Japanese flags in every county um, with a perspective, at least from the outside, that that maybe one of the states that's in the forefront of isolationism. And do people just look at investment as different than other forms of engagement? Do you think that investment sort of offsets what might be more anti-global feelings? Great question. Um, so Indiana is a red state, um, but our state governors for the past 25 years have been Republican. I would say traditional Republicans, very practical, very business-oriented, and it was through their leadership. Including Vice President Pence. Was Vice President Pence, um, Governor Mitch Daniels, um, whose father was the first executive director of the Japan Is American that right? Society I of Indiana. Know that. Wow. Um, and we opened the office together. So our, our governors have really championed Japan, have visited Japan every year. Um, so what we're seeing now with the Republican Party and the isolationism and pro-America is really different than this 30-year history um, of the Indiana-Japan relationship. I think that these communities that host Japanese companies, um, the citizens in the communities really appreciate the Japanese companies. They're good corporate citizens, very generous to their employees, generous to the communities. Um, so the the relationship is very vibrant and mature. Um, so it, it, it doesn't really reflect what we're seeing nationally um, in terms of the isolationism. So it, that's been interesting for me to witness as being part of this history and this huge flip that we're seeing. So yeah. So quick follow up then, but before I do, I just wanted to note that we will move to audience questions both in person and online in a couple of minutes. Um, if you want to submit one online, please uh, log into ccga.live, ccga.live, and uh, I will get them on my handy dandy iPad here. Uh, for those who are in the room, there's a microphone that has just been placed in the middle, uh, and feel free to start lining up now if you want. Um, and please come up with questions uh, for for them. But but so in the first panel, also we talked about Nippon Steel, and I wonder again how to reconcile this embrace of Japanese investment with a very political rejection of Japanese investment. I have a feeling that Consul General Yanagi was talking about our Indiana <laughs> governor. <laughs> right. We do have a, a U.S. steel plant in northern Indiana, um, and Governor Holcomb has been very positive and supportive of Nippon Steel's interest. Um, and again, because we have this great history, we know Japanese companies are great partners and that Nippon still will actually bring a lot of technological advancement to U.S. Steel. And as Emma pointed out, the timing is unfortunate. Um, so nobody, I think, really knows which direction it's going to go, but it could be that the timing uh, will create a result that is not favorable for Nippon Steel. That's just my personal guess. And I think that that would be a loss for U.S. Steel and the steel industry in the United States. Um, thank, thank you. So, Ryan, I want to come back to you um, and talk a little bit about the evolution of the exchange programs in particular. And also, I think that one of the questions that we as an organization wrestle with, I think we talked about this a little bit, is... Mm -hmm. You know, exchanges have been a traditional way that the U.S. and Japan have fostered better relations. I think there's a feeling that the countries know each other pretty well. What is the value, really, of ongoing exchanges as opposed to other kinds of, of, of interactions? And so talk a little bit about, you know, the ease or difficulty that you've had of funding this and, you know, why it is that you think this is an ongoing value. Um, 
<clears throat> so funding is our biggest hurdle. Um, it is entirely on the students to pay for their trip, and we do not really get money from the district itself. <clears throat> um, we used to go through private companies, uh, asking them directly, but um, th those those relationships have dwindled a little bit over time. And so one of my big pushes is to um, reach out to different organizations, different bridge organizations. The, um, the USJF has been very gracious in giving us a grant that we greatly appreciate. Um, but the evolution of it, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that it actually started with uh, not necessarily our high schools, but it started because back in well, 35 years ago, when they wanted to start the program. The one of our school librarians asked, actually Springfield, Illinois, our capital, if they knew anybody in Japan. It turns out that Ashikaga in Tochigi, where our schools are, is a sister city of Springfield. So we actually went through that route, and it has been with the same schools ever since. Got it. I just want to throw oh, please. one yeah, thing, yeah. just to tie a little bit to this and this, <clears throat> which is that the student thing is a people to people, people to people exactly. diplomacy, I feel is really, really important. And the fact that a big investment has been made by a US baseball organization, the biggest baseball contract that has ever been made, $700 million for Shohei Otani, apparently brought in 20% of the opening day tickets were bought from Japan and wow. people flew in to see that game. So you, I think it's a, it's a way that you end up with people to people diplomacy because you've got people coming over here just to see one particular player. But, you know, I mean, I think that's a wonderful opportunity to get people together. Right. Oh, go ahead, please. If I could mention something yeah. about Yuriko's great work. Um, so we make a lot of effort to introduce the story of the internment camps to Americans so that they understand American history. But we work closely with the Japanese expatriate community. They tell us that they really don't know the story of Japanese and Americans. Last year, we did a story on the camps with a survivor. There were so many new Japanese in the audience and people were filled with tears. So what you're doing is important in educating not only Americans, but also also Japan. We need to talk later. Maybe we can show the film. Okay. <laughs> so that actually does get into another topic that I wanted to raise. And, and uh, first, I, again, just want to remind people, questions if you want, please line up for the audience or send them in ccaga.live. Otherwise, we're going to just keep talking up here. I've got enough to keep you all busy for a little while. Um, and uh, just to, again, you know, with apologies to the council for maybe veering a little bit into the political, but, you know, your movie, Yuriko, was incredibly moving. But one thing that struck me watching it here today is, you know, for most of my life, when you were learning about the Japanese internment camps, it was a history lesson. It was kind of this is what happened in the 1940s, and you know we don't do that anymore. This is America, um, and you know beyond the line baseball behind barbed wire, the line that I wrote down that kind of stuck out to me was the stench of inhumanity, um, the stench of inhumanity that of being in turn like that. You know we're obviously now, I mean, in a mode where a lot of things are being raised um, that seem to be off the table for a long time, and I just wonder whether you know there's a there's a new message from the Japanese American community about sort of a, a, a warning or a discussion of, of a reminder of what happened and sort of how, what that looks like. Um, and in the course of your research, whether you're finding it's taking on a new traction. Well, there, it's not in my film, but um, I have a colleague who made a film where it was very much in the forefront because it was made several years back during a time when there were, um, Muslim exclusion policies that were being built, and also the 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 issues that were going on with the immigrant immigrant families that were being housed in poor living conditions and things, and it was the Japanese American community that stood up and said, "Okay, we need to speak up about this because this is starting to feel like something that happened, you know, to my parents' past or my grandparents' past," and so th there's been this a big push to get a protest going at the borders, the Mexican borders, and also at some of these, um, 
I think they were, they were like protest type things that people were speaking out against the bans that were happening when now we're talking in the, in the last administration. But um, so, yes, there, I mean, I think Japanese Americans and, and the JACL, which is the Japanese American Citizens League, has stepped into that role several times also. So, it, it, yes, it has been a part of it. Yeah, and I'm just curious what the other, I mean, whether you've thought about other audiences for that movie um, sort of in a new political context. Well, so um, there was one opportunity with high schools that um, the, the footage that you saw was actually made in um, Wisconsin, central rural Wisconsin. And we can talk more about the teacher head of that program. But he'd asked me to please come in and, and kick off their school year with the film. And we showed it to, I think we figured out over a thousand high school and middle school students. Um, and, um, okay, now I'm losing my train of thought here. Let's see. Um, so, uh, what did you just ask me? I was just I asking it, about the new audiences. Oh, new, new audiences. Age. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. So, um, many of the teachers had primed their kids and said, you know, we're going to see this. And one of the reasons we want to see this film and talk about it is because there's been some minor threats that these kinds of things could happen again. And so there's been a very big conversation in those schools in Wisconsin. And it was interesting to show the film and have the kids respond with questions and things because they've been primed to have this conversation after the seeing the film. And I also showed it at Syracuse University, and that was also part of the conversation is, what does this piece of history mean today, and how is it significant to things that are happening and potentially happening now? Thank you. I don't know if either of you want to weigh in on that topic or what you're seeing in the schools that, in, in, in your school, whether that becomes a topic of conversation. Or... Um, <clears throat> I'd like to add to, on to that, uh, well, you're, we're talking about exclusionary practices, uh, which America and the country, a lot of countries have a lot of some really unfortunate history with. Um, and one of the major exclusionary things that's happening nowadays, especially um, in education, is that a lot of things do become cost prohibitive. Um, going to Japan is usually a dream, but also a, like a pipe dream for a lot of young people. And my program, we do our best, like I said, to keep the cost down. Um, and that's kind of like what we do and what I do. And the, the main way I actually do that to keep the cost down is instead of having the, it's not a Japan trip. It is an exchange. So they stay in a Japanese home. And when the students come visit us and they were here for two weeks from March 11th through the 25th. So they just left. It was right at the end of their school year. Um, they stay in homes here. So you get a really strong connection and stuff that, even students who might not be able to go to Japan, they're able to host and they still get that experience. They get that immersive experience. Uh, both the Japanese students learning English or Spanish or what, depending on whatever house they stay in. Um, and when my students go there and I take a group usually in the, over the summer and um, they get, again, that, that very rich, deep experience. Um, and I'm, my goal is to make it a, not an equity issue because yeah. it, it will become an equity issue because of the cost. But we, there are ways to keep that down and to really make sure that that, as you mentioned, the person to person level of communication is really happening. Um, and I just want to quickly add that I asked my students, you sent a couple questions in advance. I asked them all to, you know, weigh in on that. And they said that above all the, the person to person communication and they said it was great just to see, like, wow, there's another teenager, not some other. It's they, they really just said, wow, we can just sit and play on our phones next to each other. Or, <laughs> or which is, <laughs> you'd be surprised. That's really a form of communication. <laughs> um, but, okay. you know, it, it's just really nice that, you know, we're able to do this in a way that is cost effective. Right. Yeah. I think we've got a question on just sir, and identify yourself and ask your question. Steve Fisher, first of all, Yuriko, that was a beautiful film, thank you. Mm -hmm. I would point out that here in Chicago, a long, the long time announcer for the Chicago White Sox is a sansei, 
Jean Honda, whose late parents were incarcerated by their government. But there's a long history here in Chicago with this community. Um, my question is really about the influence of Japanese culture onto American culture. Last week I was presenting at the American Culture Association, the um, Popular Culture Association's annual conference. At this conference, there were three panels devoted to anime. One panelist and a separate was talking about the influence of Godzilla on American culture. So three panels on anime. There's a journal, referee journal on anime studies. So this is a big influence on American culture. I was able to attend two of those panels. One thing that came out was the role of translation. Is it simultaneous translation, dubbed, or is it um, subtitled? And it turns out to be the subtitle is more preferred because people want to understand and not go back to the base language and understand what they were really meaning. So that's been a big influence. And I'm going to warn uh, Teresa, I've known you since the beginning, so I'm going to be directing a lot, some of this towards you. But it's also another it's two observations of the influence of Japanese culture on American culture. It was Suntory's acquisition of beam spirits. Spirits arguably is culture. And what has that done to change Americans' perception and global perception of Japanese culture? The other that's um, also quite in influential is the Nikkei's purchase of the Financial Times. Because the coverage of Japan has tremendously changed in the Financial Times since that happened. And that influences other um, press as well. So. For Teresa, I'm, well, I should point out the other panel that was, um, what they were asking about was the representation of Japan's imperial past in anime and how that gets represented. So for Teresa, in, in rural Indiana, apparently this is a big thing in rural America. This is how people are looking at it. Are you seeing any of this that, how is Japanese culture being perceived by Americans lately as a result. Before you answer that, I just wanted, since I'm in the mode of touting our organization, that it turns out the vice chair of our foundation's board is Takni Nami, who is the chair of Suntory or Beam Suntory. So, um, so we, we take credit for that as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead, Teresa, sorry. Steve, thank you. Um, so I'm a big Godzilla fan. Um, and Kind of interesting, last week was um, with the Japanese family and the little boy loves Godzilla, excited about the new movie coming out. And the mom was like, Teresa, why do you like Godzilla so much? And I really had to stop and think about the answer. And, and it's such a full answer, I won't take up your time. But um, maybe not the, that's not the direct answer, but... Um, a little frustrating sometimes is that a lot of Americans think Hello Kitty is American. Um, and so in some ways, Japanese culture is so deeply permeated and is so popular all around the world that people don't even realize that it originated from Japan, that that is Japan's creativity. So we really try when we're doing culture to introduce cool Japan, contemporary Japanese culture, because that's, we think, what really excites people and bringing traditional culture into that. Um, as I was thinking about today, and I am glad Steve asked the question, so throughout Indiana, so many sister city relationships that have developed in the last 30 years, three sister state prefecture relationships, Tochigi, Aichi, and Guma, um, but it's the Americans who really want to celebrate those relationships. Not that the Japanese don't, but so there are probably five or six small Japanese gardens now in Indiana. It wasn't the Japanese community that said, hey, let's put a Japanese garden in Mishawaka. It was the local community that wanted to do that. It was the local community in Carmel, Indiana, that wanted to create a magnificent Japanese garden. It was the Americans in Columbus, Indiana, that recreated the Japan Friendship Alley and they dedicated a road between buildings and it's completely decorated as an outdoor Japan corridor to celebrate their sister city relationship. Um, so 
So truly, Americans love Japan, love Japanese culture, and they want to bring that forward. And for us, it's, it's the most beautiful way to involve then our Japanese friends. It gives them a way to introduce who they are and to really connect with the community. That may not be like a true direct answer to Steve's questions, but that's Great, our you. experience. Can so, I just throw Sure, go ahead quickly, because okay, we're... So I'm old enough that when I was in grade school, there was no seaweed allowed in my lunch because, you know, ew, you're eating seaweed. You know, that was, that's what I grew up with. So when sushi became something that you could find in Indiana, it was just shocking to me. And the other thing I have to say is that my, I'm married to a guy from Ohio who is, has family in Kentucky. And one of my nephews went to a school in the middle of Kentucky, but he fell so in love with anime that he'd been studying Japanese and had nothing to do with me. He was just in love with anime. And he minored in Japanese and he ended up in Japan on the JET program. This is like blonde haired, blue eyed Henry, Henry Romer. And he goes to Japan and he, he taught English in Japan for four years with the JET program. And it all started because he was so in love with anime. So you're, I have to cut you off, but for a good reason, uh, which is that we are going to close. We had your behind barbed wire is sort of our main course. We're going to close with a dessert or an aperitif, which is a trailer of Diamond Diplomacy. Um, and I get to say, I've never been able to say this before, let's roll playback. Did I get that right? So, oh, sorry. Do we have time to do another question or we're, our clock is out? But Let's do it. All right, sure. One quick, quick question, quick answer. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sarah, and uh, I was just curious, focusing on um, like a younger generation. It does seem like ten years ago or twenty years ago, pre Netflix, pre paid and free streaming services, it seemed like there was kind of a niche group of anime loving kids, and you know maybe we were like the weird ones. But now it seems like there's been a growth of this pop culture of anime and in my opinion, it seems like more youth are getting interested in Japanese culture. Is that just from my point of view, or do you all see that as well from the younger generations? So, Ryan, I'm going to turn that to you in very quick. Yes. Well, you can, you can, you can <laughs> a, a little bit more. There is such an influx um, of, of interest in so many different ways. And one of the biggest re I always ask my students, why are you studying Japanese? And uh, the number one reason is because I want to understand my anime. Um, I, some of them, like, because they have to go through not necessarily streaming routes, but other internet routes where the fan subs might not be that good. So they're really interested. And it's it's a huge impact, but it's that's also just a gateway. So they, they get interested and then it kind of just snowballs from there. So yes, we are seeing a huge influx. So, so even though we're out of time, I'm going to just share one anecdote as the moderator's prerogative, which is, so my wife uh, was teaching Japanese history at the University of Maryland, pre-modern Japanese history, which even people who care about Japan find deadly dull. Um, <laughs> but she said that there were students who knew intimately about the Tokugawa shogunate and which clan, specifically because they learned them through anime and that was video games. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so now, again, we are going to close, and I get to say, let's roll playback. We can see Yuriko's film. So take it away, whoever is taking things away, and we'll take ourselves away. So thank you all very much. I believe baseball has taught these past few generations self-discipline, teamwork, fair play, and how to win and lose with dignity. Baseball was introduced to Japan in 1872 by a school teacher named Horace Wilson. 34 team was one of the greatest squads ever brought together at that date. Hall of Famers, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, slugger Jimmy Fox. History was made as the first baseball player of Japanese descent played for a U.S. Major League Baseball team. And they needed a certain type of player. Next thing you knew, I signed a two-year deal and the rest is history. General MacArthur called it the greatest piece of diplomacy 
ever. Few Americans knew Japan, even adopted our games. Although they marched to the baseball diamond as men marching to war. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, my father, it was just absolutely mayhem. June of 1964, manager of the Giants, Herman Franks, received a death threat. He doesn't belong in a national game. First two seasons was very, very tough, especially the first season with all this hoopla. This guy's coming from the major league, he's 31, making all this money, writing bad, bad things about me. Who would have thought 150 years later, baseball would play such a role in diplomacy between the U.S. and Japan? I've seen baseball serve as a tool for building international friendship. It cuts through communication and hardships as this tremendous way of bringing people together. Nomo pitched his first game for the LA Dodgers and it helped improve relations between the US and Japan. Ichiro Suzuki is one of the greatest players in the history of baseball. As Kini, I'm the science guy from Japan, can compete in this uniform. And it's so great to look back on, you know, 150 years ago when baseball first came to Japan. Shohei Otani is now the face of MLB baseball. Otani son has done it again! Thank you very much. Allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Craig Gaffera. I am the Assistant Director for Public Opinion and Foreign Policy here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And I want to give thanks to three different groups of people. First, our excellent panelists, both from Panel 1 and Panel 2, Dina, Emma, Consul General Yanagi, Yuriko, Ryan, Teresa, and Jake. Let's all give them a great Chicago round of applause. Second, I want to thank our great partners at the United States Japan Foundation, not only for their support of this program, but also for their longstanding support of our annual Chicago Council survey. The work that we do would not be possible without their help. And finally, I want to thank our audience, both in person and online, and especially those of you who are members of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Your membership makes the existence of this organization possible, and I thank you very much for the ability to work on these issues due to your support. Thank you very much. That concludes the stage portion of the event, but that just means we'll be transitioning to our reception in the back of the room. We'll have drinks, we'll have some more food, and hopefully some more great discussions. I look forward to seeing you all back there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.